All right, cool. I think we can get it started here. Um, welcome everybody to Education Inside Out. We are going to have a little discussion today about what we know, what we're trying when it comes to engaging incarcerated youth in education and academics. My name is John Kelly. I'm going to be your uh, moderator for today. Uh, and I'm already failing at uh, my, my slides here, of course. Uh, <laughs> with, uh, I'm the co-executive director with Foster Media Connections, which is a national nonprofit that uses the power of media and journalism to lead the conversation about children, youth, and families in America. Just a very quick word about uh, what we have going on here at FMC. We have the imprint, which is our daily news site covering child welfare and youth justice. Fostering Families Today is a uh, bi-monthly magazine that goes right into the homes of foster and kinship caregivers. Youth Voices Rising is our uh, writing program for youth and young adults with lived experience. And then our uh, brand new baby, the, uh, oh my God, I'm all over the place here. Sorry, uh, Safe Camp Audio, which is our uh, brand spanking new podcast network, just got off the ground this summer, uh, where we are going to uh, be working with folks who are doing quality audio stuff in the uh, juvenile justice, the youth justice, and child welfare space. If you want to know more about what we uh, produce all the time here at FMC, you can sign up. We have a whole bunch of newsletters. You can get a national weekly newsletter uh for the california uh, attendees today we have a monthly one for you guys same in texas minnesota and new york uh, and then also for our youth boys safe camp and fostering families today communities so you can use those bitly links that you see on your screen or you can just go to our uh, homepage, fosteringmediaconnections.org to uh, sign up for any of those that you'd be interested in and before we get started in earnest here i just want a quick shout out and thank you to the California Wellness Foundation, which has been uh, really a, a great supporter of us covering youth justice, particularly in California over the years and uh, made this uh, production here possible today. Okay, so I wanna just introduce the folks you're gonna hear from here and then get out of the way so that we can hear from them. Uh, we're gonna start, <laughs> not necessarily in the order that you're seeing them on the screen, Chris Middleton, uh, Equal Justice Works Fellow with the Youth Law Center who is going to break down some of the major findings from Youth Law Center's new research on education in California's juvenile justice system. The report is called Out of Sight, Out of Mind, How California's Education, Data, and Accountability Systems Fail Youth in Juvenile Court Schools. And you guys are going to be among the first to kind of have access to that. It just came up live today. So we'll share the link in the chat. It's also, uh, I believe, on the website now for you guys, the uh, executive summary, I should say, and then the uh, you'll have access to the entire thing very soon. We'll also include a copy of Out of Sight, Out of Mind uh, when we send out the recording and all the details and the presentation for this to, to everybody who signed up. Uh, in addition to uh, his work on this issue, Middleton's work with the Youth Law Center has included uh, school to prison pipeline, very related, uh, limiting the use of congregate care, both in juvenile and child welfare settings and conditions and confinement. Our second panelist is David Domenici, Executive Director of Break Free Education. He co-founded and served as the Executive Director of the Maya Angelou Schools, uh, which is a network of alternative schools in DC, uh, and was the founding principal of the Maya Angelou Academy, which is the school that's actually located inside of Washington, DC's secure juvenile facility. Uh, so David and his team at Break Free work with systems all over the country, uh, probably have the best national perspective on what's going on with schools and learning inside. And, uh, you know, he's going to relate some of the endem endemic problems that they see, but also more importantly, you know, what in Break Free's experience is working. It, it is promising when it comes to this idea of engaging young people in this in this suboptimal setting, right? Uh, and then last but not least, we are going back to the Youth Law Center to talk to Katie Bliss, who's a senior advocate for Youth Law Center and oversees the California Higher Education Project. Bliss is going to talk about California's relatively recent efforts to invest in the idea of connecting incarcerated youth to the world of college and higher education. And who better to do that than uh, Katie, who, because this concept is largely built on the program that she started several years ago called Project Change at the uh, San Mateo County Community College District. So she, we'll hear from her about that. So uh, without further ado, I want to go to Chris to talk about Out of Sight, Out of Mind, um, which is actually the second deep dive, you know, on this issue that Youth Law Center has done. So it's really good that uh, in the biggest state with the biggest youth justice system, we're going to have regular eyes on uh, what's going on. So, so without further ado, I'll pass it over to Chris. 
All right, so good morning. We can go to the next slide. Uh, today we're just focused on one piece of the juvenile justice system. So juvenile court schools are only one part of the school, just a, for a, record, a, a bit of like level setting. So with limited exceptions, juvenile court schools are operated by county offices of education. They're housed in juvenile um, detention facilities and they require coordination between court school staff and facility staff. And our current report is an update on a prior report that um, the Youth Law Center put out in 2016 titled Educational Injustice that was looking at the same topic. And we're going to see what progress has been made, what kind of problems have been enduring. And we're just, we don't have time to walk through the entire report. So we're gonna just tackle two questions um, that the report explored. And I'm gonna share three takeaways for y'all. And so, our report focused on reviewing publicly available data that 51 court schools submitted to the California Department of Education during two school years, the 2018-19 school year and 2021-2022, obviously avoiding those years that were most heavily impacted by COVID. Um, and so in addition to that data, we also utilized the results of several Public Records Act requests that we submitted to several county offices of education and other publicly available research and reports. And so one question we were interested in with our report was who are the students in juvenile court schools? And to answer that question, we primarily relied on reviewing the demographic information that was collected and submitted to, um, by the court schools to the California Department of Education. And so if we can go back, just, yep. Yeah. And so, our first finding was that Black and Latino youth comprised over 70% of the total students enrolled in the juvenile court school system. And that was true across both of the school years that we um, looked at. That is an overrepresentation of the makeup um, of all California public schools. Uh, our next finding was that youth that are in foster care made up over 20% of the students in court schools and um, foster youth make up only 1% in public school in California uh, to give context to that overrepresentation. Um, for students with disabilities, we, we found that the percentage rose from just above 20% to almost nearly 30% between the two school years that we looked at. And while there was inconsistent information that was collected and submitted regarding youth homelessness, we found some schools reported numbers as high as 40%, while others um, reported zero. And that we also found that over 20% of the youth were English language learners. And so when we looked at who are the young people, who are the students in juvenile court schools, we found that many of them are students who we would recognize as being vulnerable in any setting and are vulnerable in this setting as well. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so another important distinction, the PowerPoint will be shared. I, um, I will struggle keeping chat of the chat, but if I see it, I will try to respond. And yes, the slides will be shared. And so one important distinction that we found between students is that there are short-term and long-term students. And so, Students in court schools, um, we found the majority of them attended for fewer than 31 instructional days. However, we know that with the closure of the Division of Ju Juvenile Justice or G DJJ and the creation of the new um, SYTFs, we are likely to expect the number of young people who are spending longer periods of time in juvenile court schools to increase. And so we believe that there are important focuses, priorities, and goals that exist for long-term versus short-term students. Um, for short-term students, a huge priority will be ensuring that we prevent gaps in learning, ensure that there's a smooth transition back to an appropriate educational program once their time in detention is over. For students who are going to be present in juvenile court schools for a longer period of time, we have to do everything to ensure that we're providing the highest quality educational programming, including connection to community colleges, which Katie is gonna talk more about, because this is going to be a really significant portion of their education. We can go to the next slide. And so the second question that we were interested in exploring was how many court school students are missing school? And so, 
uh, we're going to look at the chronic absenteeism rate and the suspension rates to kind of explore what we learned about this question. And so at first, one might expect, if we can just go back one second. Um, yeah. Now, when thinking about this question, at first, you might expect that because there are young people who are in a um, secure facility, they're under direct supervision, that there would not be an issue with young people meeting, um, attending school. Uh, it's statutory mandated that they um, attend, and there's this higher level of supervision than what you would see in traditional schools. And we found, once again, that school students in court schools continue to miss school. And so when we look at chronic absenteeism, and so we can go to the next slide. Sorry. No, no problem. And so the chronic absenteeism rate represents the percentage of students who were absent for 10% of more for the instructional days that they were involved to attend. And so when we look at the two school years, you'll see for the 2018-19 school year, chronic absenteeism rate was higher than traditional schools. When you look at the second school year that we looked at, you'll see that while the chronic absenteeism rate increased amongst court school students, it skyrocketed amongst public school students. And there are two kind of things to say about that. The first is that across the country and across California, there has been an increase in chronic absenteeism following the pandemic. The second reason why we see this disparity in growth has to do with some of the fundamental data problems that we noticed when we were looking at this rate. So first, the data measure doesn't include most court school students. So chronic absenteeism only counts students who attend schools for more than 31 instructional days. We found that most court school students don't attend for longer than 31 instructional days. That means that most of the court school students are just not being included in this measure. And the measure was really designed for more traditional schools where there is less student mobility. And then the second problem that really isn't documented by the measure is when probation or other actors don't take students to school. And so we know that this is happening in facilities. Uh, the most, I think, famous example of this, or infamous, I should say, is that the California Attorney General has a stipulated judgment requiring LA County probation to timely transport youth to class after um, young people were not being taken and litigation had to happen to, to ensure that that would happen. Um, and we can go to the next slide. Um, once again, uh, suspensions are another source of lost instructional time for court school students. Um, and so we see here that during both school years that the suspension rate for court school students was much higher than the suspension rates for all public school students. And we see that while some progress has been made in decreasing the percentage of um, suspensions year to year, we see that the disparity persists in terms of the, the higher suspension rates for court school students. However, as troubling as these suspension rates are, they don't tell the full picture. Um, once again, we notice that there might be a fundamental data collection error. So for suspension rates, all students, regardless of how long they attended, are counted because it's based off of the cumulative enrollment. And so you have students who potentially were in the court school for a day or a week who are being counted. And so even if students haven't had, who weren't in the court school long enough to have a meaningful opportunity to be suspended, they're still gonna be part of the cumulative enrollment. So it's possible that for students who were there for a longer period of time, the suspension rate is actually much higher and we're not noticing it because of the denominator being inflated by all the short-term students that we mentioned before. And another problem that isn't captured by this data measure is that probation is still able to remove students from class and that isn't counted as a suspension. And so we noticed from the results of our, of our Public Records Act requests that schools systematically know that probation might remove students for a number of re reasons. And we also know from the Disability Rights California's recent report on Kings County that probation there at that court school routinely removed students, especially students with disability from class. Those removals aren't counted as suspensions and aren't reflected in the data that we have available to us. And so 
With that in mind, there are kind of three takeaways that we can share from the shortened version of our report. And the first one is that the current education data measures were not designed to track students in court schools. Uh, many of the measures were designed for more traditional schools where there's limited student mobility. And what make many of the things that make juvenile court schools different from traditional public schools mean that the measures don't neat, neatly map onto that student population. And we can say that we carefully measure things that we care about. So we have to question what it means that seven years later, after our initial report, the data still struggles to capture the educational experience of court school students. And so our second takeaway is that it's not just school staff. The actions of probation departments impact court school success. Today, we shared some concrete ways that probation's action or inaction can impact young people who are in juvenile court schools. We need state level stakeholders to design accountability measures that capture probation's behavior and allows us to emulate the good practices and actually disincentivize those harmful practices that we mentioned before. And lastly, we want you to know that we can't allow court school students to remain out of sight and out of mind. And California's Department of Education pledges that our state will provide a world-class education for all students from early childhood to adulthood. As long as there are still students in court schools and their quality of education remains a mystery, this mission will remain unfulfilled. We need to have the metrics and data and accountability to ensure the quality of the education of these young people. Their education matters, their lives matter, and we have to do more to ensure that the systems that we've set in place to understand how they're doing in school are accurately capturing that information and allows us to make improvements where they're necessary. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. That was an excellent breakdown of this. And again, we'll we'll make sure that people have uh, access to where they can go to see the executive summary. I should have said this at the top, but um, we are we are certainly hopeful that we can uh, get through all of our experts and you can hear from them and we'll have some time at the end for questions. Uh, throw the, your questions or comments in the chat. I cannot currently see that because I'm uh, working the slides for these guys, but once I uh, have chance to, I will uh, pop in there and try and moderate towards the end. And if uh, you guys, you know, Chris, uh, Chris kind of definitely answered one of the questions that we always get, which is, uh, are we going to send the recording? And we are. Um, but if you guys see stuff while you're talking, you want to answer it, feel free to do that. So um, with that, I'm going to pivot uh, from the framing Chris just gave us on California's, you know, data challenges and, and challenges in general to uh, to David and Break Free's experience working with uh, systems and juvenile justice facilities around the states. David, I'm sure that uh, some of the findings that you heard from Chris there kind of ring true to the challenges you see elsewhere. So, you know, feel free to reflect on that, you know, as well as sharing what you guys have found to be impactful uh, in, in different systems. Go ahead. Sounds great, thanks. All right, well, let's go ahead and go to the next slide here. And, um, yeah, so I think the first thing, just to follow up on what Chris said, um, you know, you can't learn if you don't come to school. And um, a lot of bad habits got formed during the pandemic um, where a lot of kids just didn't come initially for legitimate health and safety reasons. And then just because, in, and then for some legitimate reasons around staffing, but, but now mostly because people just don't care and aren't held accountable. So, um, before we delve into sort of like some interesting, cool stuff that helps kids get engaged, um, one of the things that we've been doing um, is really trying to help people build honest, real-time, transparent attendance um, tracking systems. Um, and the, the way we try to frame this is the, the, the custodial care agency in California, the Departments of Probation, but the custodial care agency and the education provider need to come together and set some really clear goals around attendance. And ours is pretty basic. 90% of the kids in school not on time is the goal, is a fair goal. And that's not how many kids are in the facility. And that's not kids getting packets and other nonsense while they're stuck on their units. Um, and if you can get buy-in at the leadership level to set this goal, um, and again, following up on what Chris said, the custodial care agency is are in fact the guardians for these young people. And if parents don't send their kids to school, parents, someone comes knocking on their door. Who comes knocking on their door? The state child, you know, Office of Child Family Services comes knocking on their door. Why aren't you sending your kids to school? 
And here we have the exact, we have the entity who is, is serving as the guardian, who's often failing in the most critical first step they can do, which is to have enough staff and enough philosophical commitment to get everyone to school. So I'm just gonna talk, uh, we've, if we go to the next slide, there's some examples of where we've really seen incredible progress. We do work down in New Orleans at Travis Hill schools, as, as some of you know, we directly operate those schools. And six years ago, well, really candidly, who knows how many kids went to the school in the juvenile detention center on a daily basis six, seven years ago, which is what Chris has said. But we now consistently, 90, 95% of the kids come to school just routinely every single day in the pretrial detention center in New Orleans. It's a total non-issue. Everyone's on board with it. The secure care side of the house knows it makes this facility safer. Staff enjoys it because kids get up and get to school where they're highly engaged. But we basically implemented a very, very detailed daily tracking system. I get two emails every day for the last six years, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. I get them, the principal gets them, the site superintendent gets them, the superintendent of schools for the city of New Orleans gets them, the deputy city administrator gets them, <laughs> and they're brutal. But, um, and they create a lot of pushback in it initially. But now everybody gets them, and mostly what we do is celebrate, because sometimes we have four or five days of 100% attendance, and we and people are just really, really proud of ourselves. And when things don't go right for a few days, people send an email and say, let's start talking. What's going on here? How come kids aren't coming to school? Um, we've recently done some work at, you know, with a larger multi-site uh, agency. And even just this fall, just by setting a standard, by tracking attendance daily, we have a, num a couple sites that really you know, had less than 75% attendance are now over 90% attendance just over the course of six weeks. And it's all about building these accountability systems and really, really looking honestly in real time. And on the next slide, I'll just show you an example. And I know not everybody's on the slide, but um, this is the sort of thing that we're working with people on. Um, and it's really clear. And in New Orleans, we use a slightly different one, but this is one that we're now using at some places. Um, and it makes it really clear we build this chart it gets done every single day um, at the facilities. Um, the green means the everybody on the tier got to school physically on time and it shows up green on time. Hey, hey, if the students get to school but they get there late, it shows up yellow and that raises some flags. And if the unit never makes it to school, it shows up red and then there's a selection. People are, what's, what's the main reason why students were not there? Was it staffing on the residential side? Was it that there weren't enough teachers, et cetera? Um, this is proving really helpful. It's, it's not trying to put people on blast, but it's making it really, really clear. Is it an operational staffing issue? Do we have one unit that's chronically late because they're the last group to eat breakfast? Well, if the last group to eat breakfast always eats breakfast at the time school's supposed to start, again, we have to change the way we manage our like breakfast schedules, right? So although I'm an educator, we spend now a lot of time Looking at this, kids come to school on time because people philosophically believe it's the right thing to do. They operationally put practices into place that make it really, really easy for kids to get there and hard for them not to. And next they get there because it's highly engaging and the kids actually want to come. And that's what we're now gonna focus on next. Next. Um, so we're just gonna focus here on a few minutes on a number of characteristics of what we think tends to make school work in juvenile justice settings. And some of these, not surprising, are similar to what we would see you know, in, in a lot of schools. But when school's relevant, when it's meaningful, when it's highly engaging, when it's individualized, when kids make real products and have a real audience to show what they're doing matters, when we build in the creative and performing arts into the life of the school, when the school and students are connected with community around them, and when students get a lot of acknowledgement in real time, um, hey, you've done well, and let's acknowledge you for your achievements. These are eight critical components of what makes school good. And if we go back to the earlier slide, that makes kids want to come to school, right? So what makes kids want to come to school? They want to be there. It's engaging. It's relevant. It's meaningful. Real life connections. So we're going to go through each one of those um, things now and just talk briefly about them. Um, so relevance. People talk about relevance in a, a lot of different ways, and we focus it really on two ways. One of which is not always what people think. 
The first is, and related to what Chris said, many kids go to schools in detention settings for months on end, and, the, and they know that the grades they get, the classes they take, and the credits they get don't count. And that makes it totally irrelevant. None of us would want to go to high school and not get credit. So relevance has a lot of things. One of the things we say is relevant is kids have to get grades and credits. They have to get, and they have to get transcripts get updated and you have to strike deals. School districts, you know, states have passed laws. School districts must accept these grades and credits. When kids leave mid semester, they have to get like mid-year progress reports that have to be accepted by the school they get in. And when you transfer halfway through the semester, you don't have to start over. You, if you were in algebra and you came in with a B halfway through, you start off with a B. And so state and county local laws that make it really clear are really important. So the left side of this slide is just showing some examples that there are schools that do this really well. Kids get grades, they get credits, they pass their state mandated tests at high rates. And that makes it really relevant. In Louisiana, you can't graduate high school unless you pass a couple key tests in key subject areas. And once some kids start passing those tests and kids realize, hey, you know, if I work hard, there's a good chance I'm going to pass my algebra test and get credit for algebra. It has a huge difference on the, the rest of the kids in the school. So relevance, it doesn't just mean culturally relevant and interesting. It also means it matters. You spend time, you get credit, it counts, and you move towards graduation. The second piece of relevance is what most of us think more about, and that's really, can we make the curriculum one that relates to what kids are doing? And we have some examples here um, of where, like we had, a, we ran a project and kids at the detention center um, in Portland, they built little model homes to try to solve homelessness. How would you, what, what sort of type of projects would you do if you were to build model homes to uh, tackle homelessness? We run a project around the country where um, we study Henrietta Lacks and we both talk about the cultural significance there. We talk about what are we supposed to, what, what do we owe people and when we're doing medical research. So those are examples. Rele relevance is, is a lot of things, but relevance is important. Okay. It needs to be meaningful. And there's a lot to say here, but one thing that we know really matters is kids need to develop strong, effective, appropriate relationships with adults. And we're sharing a couple images of just young people and the teachers they work with um, feeling comfortable with each other. Um, the adults are not afraid of the young kids. They're helping a young man put a tie on, right? They're hugging a young man who just graduated. That's kids need real relationships. They need relationships that are meaningful and strong. They need to know that teachers are with them and aren't going to quit on them. We also have an example of a really beautiful just collective agreement that young people sign when they come into the facility. This stuff doesn't have to all be perfectly worded and everything, but you know, this is what young people agree when they come into this school, right? We there it's it talks about what they're agreeing to in terms of how they're going to treat each other, how they're going to communicate, what they're going to try to accomplish, how they're going to try to focus on positive things. They know they have a lot of negativity coming in from the streets, but that's not what's going to happen here. And when young people come, they sign their name to it, they read it, and it really sets the tone that this is going to be like a really different, a really, really different space. We're going to focus on the positive. Um, we're going to have, a, this is going to be a place filled with joy, a place filled with love, and a place filled with respect. These are not words that people often use in juvenile detention centers, but we use them and we want more people to use them and they matter to kids. Okay. Engaging. Again, kids want to do real stuff. So what, what makes school engaging? Again, you know, one is do students have a voice in what they're doing and they, do they get some choice in what they get to do? Um, we don't believe in just putting out technology just for the sake of technology but are there ways to integrate technology into the life of the school because that matters to kids? And then third, it can be engaging because we need to know that different kids like to do different things. Some young people really like to read. Some people like to do stuff at their own pace, right? Some people like to do stuff in teams. So we need to make what we're doing day to day engaging. And again, we're showing, we're just trying to highlight quick examples here. So, um, we sponsor up in Massachusetts with all of their facilities over the summer, a really fun project. Kids design food trucks, they build them, they measure them. There's a lot of math behind this. It's not just silly, 
they create menus. They then, um, we have like a Shark Tank type activity where we have people from all over the state, the state department, other people, other teachers come in. They're presenting just like on this call using Zoom or whatever, and they're presenting their food trucks and how they design them and how much they cost to build and what their budgets are and what they're going to sell. And then they get, you know, people vote, people have rubrics and they vote on them and people, you know, win the Shark Tank contest. And this stuff really is fun, but it's also really math. And it's also really communication. Um, we also have a, another headset down here where we're just, where kids are starting to use um, some VR headsets um, where while they're doing them, they're able to explore um, science in a way that they just would not be able to do um, if they didn't have the VR headsets with them. And um, I think the caption there might, is flipped from the prior slide. I apologize. I, I think we messed that up. But um, but you'll see these are kids doing VR work where they're really able to do science and explore things they just could not explore um, when they're inside of a detention center. And um, we're doing a lot of work piloting some different VR tools with people around the country so people don't buy bad VR products, but rather really good VR products that can grow and change. Um, and there is some really great stuff that allows kids to get um, beyond the walls of their facility um, by using some really high quality VR tools. All right, what does it mean to make something individualized? Well, um, one, uh, we need to meet kids where they're at. Um, we need to do really high quality assessments of them when they arrive. We need to figure out what motivates them. And then we need to design what we do to make that work. Some really important pro things that we're working on um, there's been a lot of press and a lot of research nationally, right, about the science of reading. Um, we're doing a lot of work around the country to help people build reading programs that are based on the science of reading. And what does that mean? That means we have really explicit approaches to teaching literacy. Not surprising. The, Chris's slide didn't include you know, reading math levels of kids in detention centers in California, but you would be not not surprised to know that it's quite low for many kids. <laughs> Excuse me. So we help people build processes where both young people get a chance to really read books. They deserve the opportunity to read books and read books that they're going to be able to sink their teeth into and enjoy and relate to. But they also need really explicit work around phonics, phonemic awareness, reading comprehension, depending on their levels. So um, we're working with people to build reading programs that have two or three tiers to them. They all include reading circles. They all include the chance to read real books, talk about books, study books, engage in conversation around books. But they also include small pullout sessions um, with, with really highly trained professionals so that young people who are really struggling just to read can get the chance to learn to read and improve but 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 do that in a way where they're reading books and materials they really enjoy. So those are some sample books that you see there. Jasmine Wharton's spectacular book and another really terrific book, Promise Boys. Um, um, another way uh, that is really important, Chris uh, mentioned that in the state of California, the recent data was that 29.8% of the kids were identified as having special needs. That number plus or minus holds across the country. It's somewhere between probably 25 and 45%, depending on where you go and a host of, a host of things. But um, you can't run schools and juvenile justice facilities and just take everybody's IP and modify it and make it all the same. And three months later, have them go back to traditional schools, having gotten no support. It's not what IDA requires. It's against the law. And it certainly doesn't help young people get to where they need to get to. On the right, um, you're seeing you're seeing the motto for at Travis Hill, the motto that drives our uh, student led IEP process, which is which says nothing uh, about us without us is for us. And it's a really amazing process where young people um, drive their IEP process. When we have IEP meetings, the young people lead the IEP meetings, the young people um, um, state what their goals are. They're explicit about what sort of needs they have. And they really, really um, own this. And it's made just a huge difference for them. 
their family members. It also has allowed them when they leave us and go back to community schools to be much more empowered and have a much greater sense of self-advocacy. So if they get back to a big high school, um, they're really prepared to tell these big high schools they go back to, no, 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 that's not what I need. That's not what my IEP says. Here's what I need. Here's what I want. Here's what I'm prepared to commit to. And I also know what the law is. So individualization is really, really critical. And we should be able to do it. These facilities are usually pretty small. Um, okay, we're going to just kind of keep, what are some other things that we find really important? Not surprising. Young people want to produce real products and have real audiences for them. And so we work and train people across the country to use project-based learning and to do accomplish really high-level academic things, but also to have a chance to display their products, to, com to compete and sort of light, lightly compete, I'll say, um, and to share their works. And so, again, there are some examples here. You know, it's October, which is Youth Justice Action Month, as many people on this call probably know. We sponsor a Youth Justice Action Month art and advocacy event in New Orleans. Stakeholders from all the country, uh, all across the city come. Kids' artwork is displayed. Everybody that comes in gets these nice little cards that they can sign. And every piece of artwork is identified not by a kid's name, but by a number. And people that come in are, are encouraged to write a note about the artwork if it was meaningful to them. And then all the young people, a couple of days later, they get feedback on their artwork because all the people had come in and write these nice note cards to them. It's really spectacular. The middle slide, um, you'll see uh, in the state of Kentucky, we work with them to do this math and science project where students designed um, roller coasters using cardboard, tubes, et cetera, in facilities all around the country. They then brought students from their sites around the country to one big competition um, they got to display their roller coasters, show their roller coaster rides. Um, people graded them. Again, there's real math here. There's real science here. There's real engineering here. But um, also, just as importantly, young people got to dis got to really show off. Um, also, people around the state got to see, hey, these kids can really do math. They can really do interesting stuff. So this is another example of trying to build real products, real audiences. Um, the last slide we're showing here is... Um, uh, the last slide on the, uh, I'm sorry, the last uh, photo from the last slide, oh, I apologize there, my fault. Um, that's my fault. Uh, um, the Aspen Institute sponsors these challenges in cities around the country. Um, and again, we wanna encourage people, if there's activities for young people in your community to engage in, why not have your school compete? Um, in, in New Orleans, the Aspen Challenge um, Travis Hill was asked to compete. They produced a really incredible video where they said our solution, one of our solutions is we want to train, we want to provide mental health services to families and parents of incarcerated kids. They produced a video about it. They tied for first place in the city of New Orleans. And now Travis Hill School is following that model and has gotten funding to actually provide training to parents in the community. Um, and it's all because young people were given an opportunity they produced a great video on something they really were really wanted to get involved in. And now it's taking place in the city. So again, real, real stuff that they can do really matters. Um, not surprising to a lot of people on this call. Uh, we it's, there's just so much research um, around the benefit of bringing the creative and performing arts into the lives of young people. We really encourage people to build art and music and dance into the curriculum and to bring art teachers and creative folks into the building, either as a part of your school staffs. This is another great way to partner. There's just so many nonprofits in many, many cities um, that want to bring their artists into facilities, either for free or oftentimes at a really reduced rates. Um, it can be therapeutic, it can just be fun. It can count for art class, it can count for design class, it can count for a lot of things. Um, but uh, we, we do a lot of work around the country Art is just such a great way to get kids engaged, involved. You can also make the incorporate the art into other like contextual and, and projects that you're working on. Um, and, and it really, really works. Uh, when we send out this, there's three examples here. Um, one is a song, one is a poem, and another is a really incredible both song and video production that was 
um, done in the Kings County uh, Youth Facility, actually in California. Um, just for the sake of ease here, we're just going to listen to this very beautiful short poem, but I encourage people when you get the deck to look at the other ones as well. The reason I wrote this poem is because I wanted to embrace my culture and my heritage. The name of this poem is The Klamath Tribe by Standing Bear. Walking through Chiloquin, taking in the culture, watching the powwow, smelling the fry bread, and seeing everybody dance to the sound of the drums. Everybody speaks in my native language, E. Kairwa Subkecha, wearing the gold cross I bought with my mom, my hair braided like my ancestors. My mother gave me my face. My father gave me my anger. Just short and beautiful. Sorry about that, I had to skip through them. But. Yeah, yeah, no problem at all. Um, okay, again, remember, we're just kind of going through our, what we see as like, you know, eight key components of making education really matter for young people. So. And this one has come up before, but building partnerships with community organizations that both bring community into the facility and also allow young people with really great landing places when they leave um, really, really matters. And, and again, we're just showing some examples here. Um, in New Mexico, the uh, Film Prize Junior is partnering with the Pretrial Det Detention Center in, in Albuquerque. And the young people are making many documentaries that they're going to be able to enter into the statewide film prize contest. And um, there's really some great progress being made there. But again, these are, it's a real skill kids are getting to develop, right? They're getting to both be creative and tell their stories and connect with the community and potentially have landing places when they go back home, which is really important. You'll, in the second one here, you just see um, some stickers that, uh, kids made because in this really well-run facility in Kings County, California, they do a lot of music, art, graffiti art, and then they take the graffiti art, they turn it into stickers. The kids either have stickers that they can either give away or get, you know, sell, things like that. But again, these stickers can be really fun. I have, if I could flip my computer around here, I, I have a whole bunch on the front of my laptop that are all gener all done by kids from facilities around the country. Um, and then the third slide here again is a, is a student who started working on like music production and, and digital music while he was detained. And then upon release um, was able to get an internship and keep working at the site that produces music and helped him to produce some music while he was um, back in the community. The last one we're talking about um, is one that we all know is really important, um, which is to find ways to make sure that young people get positive feedback. Too often in detention centers, especially on the custodial care side, um, life is about points and demerits and this or that as compared to just really celebrating when um, uh, young people do well. And we just highlighted some of this. You'll see uh, this beautiful wall, which is uh, Wilson Creek, which is one of the sites in Missouri um where you know again we're just celebrating and we're acknowledging and we're posting when things go well we've done some really fun things with people around the country where when kids do well staff gives them little acknowledgement cards as compared to just like the you know go to the office for the detention cards you like it's like a positive card and you can walk down to the office and give it to you you give it to somebody and you get you know praise for it We've done situations where all those cards get posted on the walls next to kids' names, and um, uh, those cards can get copied. They can get sent home. It's really important to you know you got to have progress reports. You got to have you got to give you know report cards. Those progress reports and report cards need they just have to get mailed home. Um, you have to have award ceremonies, and when you have award ceremonies, kids need to get certificates, and those certificates should get posted on the walls of the school are in their dorm rooms and then they a copy should get sent home the stuff really matters and you really can't afford to wait till like a semester or even a quarter system you have to find ways to do this every single day every single week at every opportunity you get so these are just examples both of how some people really take positive stuff in, and show it both in the dorms and then um you know there's a graduation picture there too right 
David, thanks so much for that. Um, that was that was amazing, man. Thank you so much. And um, I know uh, for us East Coasters, we're getting towards five o'clock here, but uh, stick with us because you definitely want to hear about this program. Katie Bliss uh, is going to kind of walk us through what's going on with the kind of connection between uh, youth and incarcerated youth and 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 um, higher education in California. And then if you guys are all cool to kind of stick around, even if we get past the hour mark, um, I will definitely uh, facilitate any questions that are in the chat, which I've yet to see because I got my full screen up. So Katie, uh, uh, take it away. Thanks so much. It's great to be with all of you today to share in our community of practice um, this exciting work that's happening across our country to ensure our young people who've been impacted by the juvenile justice system have uh, strong supports and access to higher education. And as my colleague Chris shared and David shared, there's much to do to address the system barriers that are facing our students. Um, and so much is happening, uh, especially in California. And so I am hopeful to see this grow all across the country. Um, to use community college dual enrollment programming as an intervention tool for building uh, futures for our students um, who've been impacted by the juvenile justice system. Next slide. So this work has been part of a growing movement led by stakeholders representing education, law, social services, and those with lived experience in the justice system, just to name a few, over many years but most recently through advocacy efforts of Youth Law Center's Pathways to Higher Education Project and our amazing California Community College Chancellor's Office, Rising Scholars Network. Um, I just wanna take a brief moment. Um, I know there's a lot of uh, representation of that here today. So if folks wanna jump in the chat, um, if you're part of the Rising Scholars and shout out um, your programs, that'd be awesome. Because again, this is a huge movement across the state. Um, and this work has been a great opportunity to bridge our legal decarceration and alternatives to incarceration advocacy uh, to create legislation, specifically SB 178. And this has resulted in funding to create community college programs across California where our students inside facilities and those in the community impacted by the juvenile justice system have higher education programs that give them college credit and high school credit through dual enrollment, um, as well as comprehensive basic needs so that they can build positive futures. So this investment in equitable educational pathways happens only really through working collaboratively across various agencies, um, and especially lifting up the voices of our justice impacted youth. Um, so many of you here again today are in the space doing the real work to make this happen. Um, so again, really would love to hear shout outs from you all in the chat. I see Project Rebound uh, from Cal Poly Pomona has shouted out. Um, again, those of you who are doing this work in all various spaces um, are the ones who are really making this happen. And it's really exciting to keep seeing this grow. Um, so the next thing I want to highlight um, and just talk a little bit more is about this passage of SB 178 um, through our Youth Law Center's Pathways to Higher Education team and the Rising Scholars Network, um, which again is comprised of so many people. Um, there's over 85 community colleges across the state. Uh, and this program um, work has resulted in historical ongoing funding of 15 million for up to 44 colleges, both inside detention facilities and on community college campuses. Um, so just a few years ago, when you think about it, um, it's pretty incredible how much has grown. Um, there were really only a handful of college programs specifically dedicated for system impacted youth. Um, but now in California with this investment, we're going to see that, um, you know, tremendously grow with this 44 uh, colleges that have received the funding. Um, and again, that they're going to have a specific focus on youth. And so there's been work over the last decade or more um, to invest in system impacted students, but that, you know, um, had a lot of emphasis on the adult population, jails and prisons, which is extremely important. But we all knew as a um, you know, group of advocates and folks out in the field doing this, that there needed to be specific attention to our young people. Um, so ultimately, this significant movement um, has led to some very specific requirements um, for the programming, which here I'm going to share with you what this model looks like. 
Um, and that is inclusive of having, um, let's see. Oh, I had a little, yeah. So um, these courses, again, through dual enrollment, uh, offer students both high school credit and college credit at the same time. So this is an intervention tool and an opportunity for our young people to be able to begin their college pathways as early as 15, 16 years old um, and begin to see themselves, not even just see themselves, actually be college students, but again, expedite their high school education at the same time. And this is also traditional and enrollment. So for our students who have graduated, um, then they're getting started on their college uh, degree pathways right now. Um, in addition to that, there is a comprehensive aspect to this model where um, students are supported in their transition to their local community college campus um, with, again, the intentionality too on uh, on um, transferring to university. We see students um, going off to four-year universities after this. Um, and so, as mentioned in the chat, in California, um, Project Rebound, um, underground scholars are at the UCs and CSUs. And we see this pipeline beginning to be created, a different pipeline, um, which is our students starting in high school, getting college credit, um, going to their local community college campus, and then going to university and um, continuing with their education and then going into their various career fields. Um, another aspect of this model that is really critical is an emphasis on alternatives to incarceration and alternatives to really um, community and alternative schools um, where students can be taking these dual enrollment courses at their local community college campus or again, while they're inside facilities. And um, this is an opportunity for them to really build their uh, credits towards degree completion, um, both high school and college. But also this is an opportunity for um, folks to be able to implement early release um, if, if students are able to then go to their college campus and start taking these classes. Uh, this has been a huge boost um, that I've seen in programs across the state where young people are enrolled in these college uh, programs and then they have the opportunity to be able to be released early uh, to go to their college campuses and to be continuing their educational pathways um, or for this to be something that is in place altogether so that they're just in their community taking courses um, and not in detention facilities or alternative schools at all, um, which is really exciting. Um, one of the last things I just want to emphasize in this piece, too, is the community building aspect of this. We're talking about youth. We're talking about teenagers. Um, and for those of us who recall how important it is to have um, your peers around you at that age and who matters most to you at that age is your peers. And this is really such a community building aspect. Um, and, you know, you start to create this entirely different world of positive um, peers who are all working towards the same goals. Um, this is also positive uh, relationships with adults um, that get built. Uh, a lot of programs have mentoring embedded in their programs. There's just a whole wealth of identity and um, youth development that are part of these programs, again, both in facilities and when students are on their college campus. Um, next slide, please. So um, let's see, this next uh, piece really, so much of the core of this movement is envisioning our young people um, impacted by the justice system as scholars and college material, both to demystify for the larger community, but also for these students themselves. Um, so as mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, the legislation includes um, some really key aspects of um, program modeling that the colleges across the state are rolling out, which again includes dual enrollment, that these courses that students are receiving where professors come into the facility and teach or they're doing this online um, are always for credit. So students are always receiving um, credit that is transferable to university and again is also uh, applicable to their high school credit. So again, we're also flipping this paradigm from a deficit model um, to a growth model where we're telling these students, 
we really truly believe in you. We want the bar held high. And we're going to also build in scaffolding um, approaches, tutoring, uh, you know, various types of courses. Some include, uh, you know, courses that are introductory so that students can build up their capacity to take, uh, you know, much more intensive courses. Regardless, the message is all students should be receiving um, this type of educational programming. And wanted to just take a moment because um, our, you know, some of our students are on the slide uh, that we've seen uh, over the last decade with uh, the Project Change Program, which is the model in the legislation. Um, students, again, you know, while they were in juvenile hall, uh, taking dual enrollment courses as young as 15, 16 years old, going to uh, their local community college campus. And um, one example of that is one of our students, Jackie, who had the experience of taking dual enrollment courses while she was in uh, juvenile hall um, and then going to uh, the College of San Mateo and continuing her education and then transferring to UCLA where she joined the underground scholars. Um, so there's that pipeline. And then she graduated and she joined us at Youth Law Center recently to grow out um, the statewide student cohort that's being built uh, because we want to center youth voice in the continuous advocacy of this work. And now, uh, just in the last couple of months, she has gone off um, to go to Stanford Law School, where she is um, doing that path, which is just the most exciting thing ever. Um, and these are just some of those examples. Uh, and lastly, I'll just shout out um, that we have one of our student alumni who's running um, Project Change at this point, too. So the list goes on. Students just, um, you know, it's been a decade of watching dual enrollment. Um, and watching students graduate and then go into their career fields. And it just continues to grow into the next generation. Um, so I'll just move into the next slide um, and just highlight again, a couple of these pieces that are included in the model. Um, and some of the most important pieces I think is again, the emphasis on making sure that the courses that are offered to our youth are uh, both for college credit and high school credit through dual enrollment, um, which again is such a great opportunity to be an intervention and an opportunity to be an alternative, um, again, to alternative schools or uh, court schools, and also an opportunity for our young people to be in college programming and be in their home community. And there's a variety of different courses that we don't have time to cover, uh, but some include ethnic studies, um, English, math, some of those kind of core uh, courses that students are required to take in order to move forward with any pathway they desire. Um, and that also includes CTE. So students have an opportunity to pursue both um, four-year university pathways um, as well as career fields. And this is all comprehensive within community colleges. Um, it looks different in different states, uh, but ultimately this is something that's available and can be uh, replicated in states all across the country. Next slide. Um, so just a couple key takeaways uh, that I wanna emphasize is that this takes a huge community of folks to work together. That's something that's happening um, with the rollout of the Rising Scholars uh, work in California with these community colleges offering programming um, where they're working with, there's the community college lead, they're working with their county office of education, um, working with probation, working with um, you know private defenders, public defenders and juvenile justice judges uh, and that again, um, all of the key components of the types of courses that are being offered are to make sure that our students um, are not just being told what colleges, but are actually college students themselves. Uh, and that lastly, this is something that is sustainable, um, where there's comprehensive support, including basic needs uh, and financial aid and the full package, because we don't want to just, um, again, share with students that they can go to college, without making sure that they have everything in place to be successful while they are attending college. Um, so there's a million things to share, um, but we don't have time for that. So happy to um, chat offline um, and also share additional resources, but um, just a shout out to all the folks who have made this happen um, and thank you for having us. Thank you, Katie. And uh, her Katie's email is up here. Uh, I, I think Chris already shared his in the chat. David, I don't know if you have it or you want to. Um, I should have probably asked guests for that. My bad. Um, 
I'm going to dip into the uh, chat in a second and see if there are any questions. There was a lively conversation back and forth, but <laughs> it looked to me earlier on like everybody answered them. Uh, but I'll, I'll take a peek in a second. But Katie, I wanted to ask you one thing, you know, if you, if, if you're somebody from another state, right, obviously California is now kind of embarking or already has embarked on this kind of statewide initiative with, with what you, what you discussed today. Um, but you're in a state with none of this is happening. What would be your advice to that person if they were like, God, I really want to get this going? Would it be to kind of start with something like you built in San Mateo or how would you like advise somebody to, to get going on something like this? Um, well, one suggestion for sure is that, uh, I mean, depending on what agency you're coming from, and that's something I want to emphasize is that this, the way that these programs have been built across the state that I've witnessed um, that are very powerful. And again, hopefully people shared out other powerful programs in the chat too. Um, some people started with, uh, you know, advocacy from their local county office of education. Um, some people started off with a nonprofit organization. Um, some came from the community college, regardless of what stakeholder is driving the force. There are people who need to be at the table. And those are the people that need to be at the table in order to offer higher education programming for our young people. So it's um, building those connections um, and getting those discussions started. And so again, that would be your community college. And in you know, it doesn't matter what state you're part of, at least they exist all across our country. Um, and also a county office of education and probation and um, making sure that your you know private defender uh, folks are at the table as well. We have some handouts that are helpful for that too about who the community partners are. Um, and of course, happy to share with other folks if you're interested in building a program. Um, there's lots of best practices um, and examples and also a whole community, as I mentioned, which is the Rising Scholars Network uh, that is comprised of all of these uh, programs all across the state um, who are doing this, who I know are um, often happy to share out some of their best practices as well. Right on. And I think you've got one uh, kind of just practical question in here. Uh, I think it was directed at you, which is just what is the age range of the participants in, in Rising Scholars? I mean, is there a minimum age you have to be, you know, even if you are in one of these facilities to qualify? You don't, um, there's not a minimum, but what I would say is that again, this is, um, and now, especially with this grant funding um, and what's happening is that the emphasis is on dual enrollment. So now we're starting with um, students who are in high school. And again, that can be for both high school age students and, uh, you know, graduates. So it's both. Um, so we see students as young as I, you know, I had a student when we started that was 14. Um, and so I'm sure people have uh, other examples as well, but that's that's the age range I would um, say is it's anywhere from 14 to um, 24, 25. Um, so it's a pretty it's a pretty robust um, group. Right on, uh, David. You had I think this was kind of aimed at you and what you were talking about as far as um, setting setting you know goals for attendance. Um, Priscilla had a question, a couple of questions there. What are the accountability system that were developed for increase in attendance and are students made aware that if they don't attend the program they'll be removed or they specifically won't have access to them i i, I apologize priscilla if i'm uh, incorrectly paraphrasing this but i kind of took those to be part and parcel of how do you get um the students to buy into that goal right you've got the 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 school system or the the facility how do you how do you get them on board David, I think you're muted. Oh, I think you might be muted, yeah. Sorry about that. My fault. Yeah, sorry. Thanks, Chris. Uh, you know, we've, uh, except for rare instances, we've really found the issue of students not wanting to come to school. Well, we found it mostly to be something that happens rarely when other things take place, which is if all the adults in the facility, both on the morning shift and in school, are really enthused about school um, and prioritize school. And then if school is engaging and meaningful and relevant, um, most kids would prefer to get up and go. Um, I mean, related again, exactly to things that Kate's talking about. If you already have your high school diploma, 
And going to school means you travel around all day with kids who don't have their high school diploma and you don't have any chance to take post-secondary class or anything else. Well, you're right. Why the hell do you want to go? You don't. You say, I don't want to go. And then the whole unit gets right, right. Then things get slowed down and then you get into an argument. So uh, we we mostly, you know, we, we, we deal with this issue of like kids refusing, not by saying you're not permitted to refuse, but by sort of addressing everybody in the building gets on board with what do we need to do to help every kid want to get up and go? And you'll be surprised that if kids have some options, some voice, some interesting choice, <laughs> Um, if all the adults are preaching it, you know, you really end up with just about everybody wanting to go. It, a lot of it is that the adults don't put things in place that make young kids want to get up and go. I, I think that's that piece of the question. On, on the straight, on the other piece, um, you kind of got two options. One, you try to get buy-in from the facility side of the house that um, getting kids to school is a mutual responsibility by kind of saying what I've just said. It's you're the you're the guardians. You're, you're 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 the fiduciaries. Every other kid's parents in the state have to get their kids to school every day, and you need to get your kids there. If that doesn't kind of start to work, even if you're on the inside as an educator, my recommendation is you start to talk about things and reach out to the advocacy community. Um, IDEA, you know, under federal law, most federal most state law, kids have to come to school, and the custodial care agencies, the county probation departments in California and otherwise, they're not immune from this stuff. They're going to get sued and they should get sued. If they can't get enough staff and bring kids over to school, they should get sued. Um, and parents and kids can become advocates for that too. And we're trying to build and support networks of that where um, kid, parents of kids who are incarcerated should get a note if their kids don't come to school every day. If my kids don't go to school, I get a note that says like, where the hell's your kid? He's absent. And we're trying to encourage schools the secure care side of the house doesn't bring them over. Power schools should send out that nice little text. You know, your kid didn't come to school today. And the reason is because the secure care staff said they didn't have enough staff. And we got to then train and have, get, help parents get that text and, and do something with it. Uh, Odilla from uh, Bay Legal asked, and I, I'm pretty sure this is to you, David, that, you know, some of the things that you talked through, including the uh, sort of goal setting and tracking of attendance and some of the things you talked about in terms of what works is there, do you guys have toolkits for setting up these kind of models? You know, do you have some things you sort of give away? I know you work pretty intensely with some of these. Yeah, systems. sure. You have some stuff if, available. Um, if people just go to our website, which is, you know, just Google breakfree.org and then go to teacher resources. Um, we put, we've put out monthly initiatives as, as you're familiar with, John, that um, are all project based and they basically, a, a lot of these boxes get checked, they're relevant, they're engaging, they oftentimes have chances for kids to produce tool, produce products and, and get judged, they're national in scope, so teachers and kids are participating in things from around the country, so that all, that, all those resources are there and free and available. We also take a lot of calls and are happy to work with people. On the like attendance front, it's not quite as easy as that, but if anybody wants to email me, we're happy to work with you and try to sort of like give you a couple of tools. We have two or three different kind of low tech models, kind of like the one I showed you that we've used in different places to try to help people just yeah. push this in. <laughs> have you seen, uh, so Katie, Katie kind of broke down what what's going on in California with the connection to higher education. Have you seen that? tried anywhere else i know utah's got something going uh that's a little bit more modest i think but have you seen this uh, play out anywhere else um i think california is leading the charge here um i mean part of this is all these states you know the ecosystems the way education is delivered is just you know good or bad so different in in so many places um you know like i'm doing work in maryland and and maryland does have maryland department of juvenile services has partnerships with almost all the community colleges now to help um, allow so that if young kids are on the inside, they can start taking classes and then continue them when they are released. But it's not funded and it's not supported in a in a systemic way like half is happening in California, right? The Department of Juvenile Services is like buying, buying, buying classes or like buying credits. Does that make sense? You know, from the community colleges. And then at some point, the kids will become fully enrolled and potentially you know, apply for financial aid. But at the moment, it's a little bit more, uh, it's a little more hit or miss in most of the places where we're working.
Katie, going the other way, have uh, have you heard from states or even from like big counties? Like, does anybody come knocking, being like, "How do we do this?" Like, <laughs> yes, I mean, we've had oh, a lot of outreach um, from across the country with people wanting to do more work um, because certainly there is work happening. But as you know, David mentioned too, it's not. Um, it is historic and nationally historic what California has invested in to specifically focus on our youth impacted by the juvenile justice system. And also just want to emphasize that the investment was in the community colleges um, and for the colleges to lead these efforts, um, which is really important and exciting um, because this is coming from that education lens and not from um, a probation lens and that we're really centering it there um, to make sure that our students are supported uh, in this kind of way. And so, yeah, it, it is um, exciting to see it hopefully continue to grow, um, not just across California, but everywhere, because these students deserve that. Absolutely. I think this will be the last one. I'm going to route it to you first, Chris. Um, I'm curious if you saw anything about this in the data. But Deidre wrote that she was a school psychologist and works with students who've been charged with a sexual crime. Um, and it's been a struggle to get the agency or courts to incorporate their IEP, their individual education plan, as part of their court case. And I was curious, you know, in in your kind of deep dive and what you've been able to get out of the information from California, did you learn anything about the, you know, fidelity to IEPs, the presence of IEPs? Because that is a pretty important thing. I'll let you two uh, ring in if you have thoughts too afterwards. Yeah. And so we know from the demographic data around the number of students with disabilities that there should be a fair number of students who have um, IEPs that are in place. But I mean, I, I will say that this is like an area where I think the current data measures fall short. It's really difficult to know whether or not IEPs are being implemented by looking at the current available data. Um, we've really kind of relied on investigations that were done by organi other organizations. For example, like Disability Rights um, California did an investigation into Kings County in California. And one of the things that they noted were disruptions by probation staff of school around like young people who had documented disabilities, had IEPs, had ways in which education were supposed to be delivered that were being disrupted. And so we know that this is a problem. What we don't know is the exact scale at which it happens. And I don't wanna infer into all of the court schools that this is a problem, but we have to know what is actually happening. And so this is a, an area I think of, of grave concern for us because we're not able to actually um, properly document and understand what is happening in court schools. I, I, I just out of my own curiosity, I hate to put you on the spot, but if you, if the state, you know, genie style could grant you one wish in terms of data, like one thing you are have not been able to kind of surface through all of the, the good work you guys have done on these reports, like what is the one metric that you just are dying to know and feel like the state's flying blind on in terms of measuring what's going on? <laughs> I mean, I, I think that's a really hard question. Uh, I, I think I'll, I'll limit myself to um, kind of what I, <laughs> uh, I think I'll, uh, I think one area that we ran into, for example, was with um, the redaction of data. And so we think that student privacy is very important and we understand the emphasis behind it. But even in looking at the demographic data, when there are court schools that have populations under 10%, and we'll just use like race and ethnicity for an example. Um, if it's under 10, if it's under a count of 10, like so 10 students, that's redacted. And so what happened in the 2021 to 2022 school year is that I, I think it was um, just over 14% of, of that data was redacted. And so we aren't actually able to capture the demographics. So when you look at the data that's available, it says that there are no native students. There are no Asian students in juvenile mm -hmm. court schools, which we, we kind of understand that to be not accurate, but that's what the data shows because of how the data is collected and redacted. And so I think if we want to just fundamentally understand who our students are, we have to do something to allow for the at least uh, kind of regional or state collected data to not be redacted, to fully capture a kind of where we are in a given year. Um, and I think that that is within the, I, I don't think you need a genie to do that. I think that that is something <laughs> that could be added it to do. But if, yeah. if I had to point to something that we noticed that we weren't expecting, it's just the significant impact 
that redaction had on on kind of disappearing some of the students who whose experiences we wanted to capture and document. Yeah, no genie needed. I agree. Okay, for real, this is the last one because it just popped up, and I think it's a good one, Katie. Uh, along the the uh, same similar lines with the um, IEPs. Um, I'm going to guess it's Mari, M-A-R-I. Uh, how does IEP impact the dual enrollment classes? Community colleges do not utilize IEPs. They have a different plan. So does that is that a thing you bump up against at all? I mean, yes. I mean, there's always uh, so much to navigate, but ultimately the, the message is too that there needs to be embedded support um, and that all of these students should be able to access these courses um, regardless of anything. Um, and so that it, and also uh, it is a part of the programming uh, model as well that um, DSPS on college campus, uh, community college campuses are an embedded support of the program, um, whether that means that uh, students are being connected to the services and all various services that they qualify for. And also it's really important to create the warm handoff, um, which is a best practice. Um, and again, if folks wanna look at um, the various best practices that the Rising Scholars Network has listed um, and pathways um, to higher education, uh, from Youth Law Center, we've listed some resources as well. Um, it's important that we're introducing students as well to the people who are running um, these services on a college campus while they're inside of a facility. So we bring folks um, to the facility, for example, from DSPS to be introduced to students through workshops, um, as well as when they're on the college campus, making sure again that they're connected to all of these services. So I mean, there's a lot of things to say about this, um, but ultimately, again, the message is that there should be um, you know, no barrier and any barriers that start to pop up should be dealt with. Um, all these students deserve to be connected to these resources and college. Absolutely. Well, I think that wraps it up for us, guys. Thank you all for staying like past the hour or two and answering some questions here. This is awesome um, for attendees or for that. Well, they won't be here to know this, but anybody who signed up, even if you weren't here, you're going to get it. We'll get you the recording. We'll get you out of sight, out of mind. Um, we'll also be sending out a survey just to hear how we did, what you could have heard more about, what we could have done better, what we liked, all that stuff. Um, so you can expect that uh, coming to you in the very near future. But for um, for myself and Fostering Media Connections, I want to thank the three of you, Chris, Katie, and David, for, for showing up today and, and really talking through some important stuff with these guys. Uh, so thanks. And uh, everybody who attended, thank you guys and have a lovely afternoon. Thanks, thanks everybody. Bye. Bye, everyone.